Hi, I'm Pastor Brenda Walker. Thank you for joining me today. I am a retired Presbyterian minister, and after 40 years of ministry in congregations, I'm now a writer full time, and I have a mission. The theme of my mission is compassion is a matter of life and death. I am writing a memoir. It is entitled Martine, a memoir about my oldest sibling who was transgender. And as I uncovered our family story and the life of Martine, I have come into a new calling, which is to be a bridge to congregations and faith communities to help them understand the experience of being transgender and so that they can be educated advocates and provide safe and welcoming spaces for transgender people and their allies. And this project really is about the fact that compassion is a matter of life and death. Today I am interviewing Ted Lewis, who is the director of Side by Side in Richmond, Virginia. I'm so glad that you're going to join us. We're going to be talking about the work of Side by Side, which is supporting LGBTQ youth in this community, providing resources for them and support for them at this time in their lives and helping us be a support system for these young people. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me last week. Sure and for agreeing to be in this Zoom interview today. Happy to. And as I shared with you in our phone call, since I first started taking classes at Life in 10 Minutes, and as my story began to come out, people would tell me, you you know, these are some folks you need to know about and um, resource with, and so I'm really happy to be in touch with you. And my first question is just, how are you doing in the midst of this pandemic? <clears throat> yeah, uh, you know, the pandemic has, of course, I think changed everybody's uh, work and life in many different ways. Um, you know, our staff is all working uh, remotely, and uh, we've had to close down our, our Richmond Youth Center uh, until it's sort of safe to be back in face-to-face -face contact. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, difficult, I think, for uh, a lot of the staff, you know, working um, trying to balance dealing with the pandemic and, and supporting our community as best we can. Um, but we are doing well, uh, I think, all things considered, um, and uh, hope you are uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have many friends who are pastors of churches and work in churches, and I really feel for them in having to completely retool and minister to people, and particularly funerals. Um, uh, weddings. Uh, my daughter is getting married in August and we're completely changing what we're doing and I'm actually going to officiate whereas I was going to be the mother of the bride and I'll be both things this time just smaller ceremony. Yeah. Uh, so there's lots of things change and I really feel for people who are isolated and some who are quarantined in situations that are not completely comfortable. I'm thinking yeah. about uh, youth uh, mm -hmm. that you work with and everything. So I'm doing fine myself because everything I'm doing in writing, and I've even, I was going to do in-person interviews, but now I'm interviews and everybody's doing Zoom interviews, so it's kind of a normal <laughs> thing. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So what are what's different about how you are caring for youth in this pandemic time and and speak about what services you offer for youth generally sure so you know we're based in richmond um but and we serve sort of two age ranges with different programming and so our, our support groups mental health counseling our drop-in center in richmond as well as our satellite groups in Charlottesville and Petersburg work with youth ages 11 to 20. So that's middle school through high school and a little bit beyond. And we provide weekly support groups, mental health counseling, drop-in center, and all of those shifted to Zoom platforms uh, starting March 16th. So we're now two months in to doing those Zoom meetings. 
And we're at about, depending on the group, uh, 60 to 70 percent of what we would see in in-person in terms of participation. You know, a lot of our, our youth, particularly if they're still in school, are uh, on Zoom or other web-based platforms all day for school. Uh, and it takes a toll on your, you know, your, your emotions and your, your, your physical health. A lot of people talk about the Zoom exhaustion uh, and it's, it's real. And so um, we have done our best to do individual outreach to youth who were regularly attending our programs that we haven't heard from just to check in, see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. And we've actually had 18 new youth join support groups since the pandemic started. Uh, and we've been able to continue our one-on-one -on -one mental health counseling out of our Richmond office uh, with Dr. Lisa Griffin, who specializes in working with transgender youth, but supports all LGBTQ youth. Mm -hmm. And we've had two new youth sign up for that mental health counseling. And thanks to the support of CarMax and others, we're able to provide that counseling at no cost to the family. So it's no insurance, no copay. It's 100% covered by side by side. Wow. And, and um, our other population is LGBTQ young adults, 18 to 25, who are experiencing housing instability or homelessness. Mm -hmm. And we have a host home program, which is sort of the best way to describe it is sort of like Airbnb without a fee. So you have a spare bedroom and you let a young person stay in that bedroom until they get back on their feet. And mm -hmm. we provide case management and support for that young person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because of the pandemic and the stay at home order, we haven't been able to place any young people in host homes right now. Yeah. Um, but that will potentially shift soon as restrictions start to lift. Mm -hmm. um, but we are, you know, still providing support, case management, virtual meetings with those young people. And we set up a rent assistance fund, which uh, takes in donations and then distributes them to young people. And mm -hmm. even though it's called a rent assistance fund, it really covers rent, utilities, mm -hmm. sort of any immediate costs that would keep a person in stable housing or even stably employed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw on your website that you were taking applications for host homes for when it's safe or when restrictions allow people to uh, have someone come in your home. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and that what I would say is that's our, our biggest need right now because um, mm -hmm. we're anticipating uh, a pretty big uptick in um, homelessness coming out of the pandemic. Yeah. Whether it is young people who were home with family who have been outed or have come out to family and that didn't go well, mm -hmm. or it's young people who were stable living on their own but then they lost their job or they're just and they're already disconnected from family right. and there's no safety net to sort of pick them up right uh, and so we're really anticipating that and with our younger youth we're seeing similar things in terms of being outed to their family mm -hmm. or family not being as supportive necessarily mm -hmm. we have young folks that can't join us on their zoom calls because their family won't let them mm -hmm. or their family um, doesn't maybe have the resources to do, uh, you know, the technology. Um, some households only have one computer and three or four children trying to use that or um, other sort of economic restraints. So with the, with our younger youth, we're seeing, uh, and our older young adults, we're seeing a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear. Uh, and to be quite frank, we're seeing that with adults too, right? Not sure what's happening, not sure what's coming next. Mm -hmm. Not sure what the extent of the economic fallout is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because of that, we've shifted a lot of our support group curriculum to be more social focused. Mm -hmm. So we still do coping strategies. We still talk about positive identity development. But we're working in things like um, the Netflix watch parties where everyone uses their own account to collectively mm -hmm. watch a movie together mm -hmm. or do charades over Zoom or do uh, we did a virtual pet talent show where young people could just show off their, you know, furry friends at home. Right. Uh, more of those ways for young people to just connect on a social level mm -hmm. uh, and hang out, which is what they're really missing, I think, right now is having those supportive friends just to hang out with. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, those creative ideas. I love, I love the pets, yes. showing off your pets. Oh, yes. Um, so another question I have is, what advice would you give or what resources are there for someone who is new to being an ally? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, I think that uh, one uh, question I often have folks that want to sort of new or new to being an ally mm -hmm. is if they're being an ally because of a family member or a close friend. And if they're doing that for a family member, like in your case with your sibling, or if it's with a child or a parent, there are some amazing family support groups in uh, mm -hmm. the country and, and specifically here in Richmond. Um, one of which is uh, a national organization called PFLAG, which many people have heard of. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, we are fortunate to have a, a chapter here in Richmond as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in Richmond, we also have a group called He, She, Z, and We, which is a parent group for parents of transgender youth. And it does work with other uh, family members as well, siblings and um, children of transgender parents, etc. And what we found is when it's a family member, particularly if you're dealing with someone who is coming out as transgender, right. it takes time to mm -hmm. fully wrap your head around what it means to be transgender and then to make the mental switch around mm -hmm. names and pronouns and understand this person as who they are. Right. And having a support network of other people who have been through that, yeah. who can talk to you. And we always sort of tell parents, you know, the same way your youth deserves a space to be themselves, to mm -hmm. talk through what they're going through, to laugh mm -hmm. and cry, you deserve that space too. And you also deserve a space to mess up and process that's not in front of that transgender family member or transgender friend. Right. And that's where those family groups become really, really helpful and really, really important. And we're fortunate that those groups have been able to continue during the pandemic utilizing mm -hmm. Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're still meeting, uh, whether it is as a group or even individual consultations with families. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're just a sort of an individual in the community that wants to learn more, I would say mm -hmm. there's definitely some great books sounds like you're working on one that will be a resource soon yeah. uh, that are out there um, and i think that you know part of it's also looking at um looking and challenging your friend network and your work friends and your mm -hmm. colleagues and mm -hmm. your church or faith community <clears throat> about how they see lgbtq people right, right. and with you know a lot of the um, because you're a pastor and, mm -hmm. and you work with uh, faith communities Faith communities often have, you know, this sort of uh, spectrum of support, if you will, of either condemning LGBTQ people mm -hmm. or being fully affirming. And then there's most folks in the middle that are either silent or okay on some stuff, but not on others. Right. And where allies can really do some good work is not only listening to LGBTQ folks and their stories and supporting them, but also helping to speak up and challenge institutions and, and workplace norms and even friend groups to be more affirming to who those people are. Right, right, that's good. Very well said, I really, really appreciate that. That's yeah. good. Um, what are resources that LGBT youth need in their community? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the Family Acceptance Project put out several years ago sort of the three pathways to risk, uh, risk being, you know, suicide or depression, mm -hmm. self-harm, other mental health concerns. And those were really family rejection, isolation, and a harsh environment. And at Side by Side, those are sort of the three pillars we think about in terms of what youth need. Mm -hmm. And so they need a family that supports them, that sees them for who they are, mm -hmm. that uh, affirms their identity, and that treats them with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, for... Um, LGBTQ youth that from a faith lens that also includes being told that you know that the the higher being that they worship loves and appreciates them that doesn't condemn them that they're not going to hell or some other you know horrible place right. um, and then when we talk about isolation LGBTQ youth are often disconnected from their peers they're seen as other they're seen as uh, different um, and so they need LGBTQ and ally friend network uh, mm -hmm. and supportive adults. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, they also need to see LGBTQ adults that share an identity that they have thriving in the world. Yeah. And so, you know, we uh, borrow a phrase from the transgender actress Laverne Cox. She uses the term possibility model instead of role model. Yeah. And instead of saying you're a role model, which means you do everything I did, sort of has a lot of weight to it. Yeah. Possibility model simply talks about a possible future. So, Regardless of how you feel about his politics, Pete Buttigieg running for president changed a lot of people's understanding of what it meant to be gay in America. 
Absolutely. And seeing him on the stage talking about his husband, talking about his family, that gives young gay people, and particularly gay men, mm -hmm. uh, a possible future there, right? They see right. that possibility, right? Yeah. And as we see, you know, more and more out LGBTQ adults talking about their identity publicly. Mm -hmm. uh, in Virginia, we see that with, you know, Danica Rome being elected to the General Assembly. Yeah. You know, her election also was huge for transgender kids and particularly transgender girls who could say, oh my gosh, she's like me. And look, she got elected. Yeah. And she got elected in a district that had previously elected a very anti-LGBTQ mm -hmm. representative. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is a harsh environment. And that's really what we're seeing when we talk about bullying and we talk about violence and harassment. And so yeah. that is everything from the comments like, that's so gay, mm -hmm. um, to uh, things around, you know, don't be a girl or you throw like a girl, to things like um, calling people names or even physical or even sometimes sexual violence against LGBTQ young people. Mm -hmm. And those harsh environments really uh, add up. And I think sometimes what we miss in the harsh environment in the new world is that uh, social media allows for bullying to happen 24-7, 365. When I was young uh, and would be picked on at school, when I went home, I had a supportive family. And so the bullying stopped when the bell rang. Yeah. Um, today, it follows you. It's in your pocket. Uh, it's with you all the time. Yeah. And so that really changes the dynamics uh, mm -hmm. of what it means to be sort of harassed for who you are. Yeah. And even things like uh, comments on local news stories with complete strangers where you see a positive story about your community and then you go down in the comments and people just say horrible things about who you are. Yeah. That gets really hard to, to hold on to yeah. uh, and can dramatically impact your mental health. Mm -hmm. So we really view, you know, working on having supportive families mm -hmm. and those families having resources for those families to also process that when their young person comes out. Mm -hmm. LGBTQ youth having connections to supportive peers, people who are like them and seeing adults as possibility models and then changing the environments that these young people live in so that they're not bullied in school, or if they are, there are repercussions and there's uh, accountability on those bullies. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that. So clearly thought out those three areas. Mm -hmm. And with social media, um, it has enabled me to be in touch with transgender people actually around the world and to really, and to find, um, people who assist those who are transgender and their loved ones and to network and, and to learn more, I can find out so much. But at the same time, the same universe that is allowing that allows people to be, people to be bullied, just as you said. Um, and the phone always with you. And yet that can be the source of bullying with the things that come through. So yeah, the very thing that can help us is there also and can hurt us. So having boundaries around that is really important and educating people so that harsh will be there. Yeah. Um, so you've, you've touched on this some, but uh, a little more, if you would, about churches and faith communities and the role they can play and, and maybe some ways you have seen them play a role and some things that have been good and some that obviously have not been good. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah. You know, I think that faith communities play a really big role in our lives. And sometimes, you know, as someone, for example, who didn't grow up in a faith tradition, mm -hmm. um, my family, you know, more prayed at home. We didn't really go to services on a regular basis. Right. And so I didn't fully understand what faith community meant until mm -hmm. I was an adult and sort of could experience it with friends, with loved ones, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think what people who don't grow up in those traditions miss is that when you're a part of a church, a synagogue, a mosque, you're a part of a community. You know, that is not only where you go for service on Sunday or Saturday night or whenever, but it's also the picnic and the summer vacation camp and the people you go on vacation with and who you go to dinner with. And, you know, it is a network of support. And when your church doesn't really accept who you are, that means you're often cut off from that community or feel like you have to hide within that community. And one thing we see a lot of in faith communities of all stripes is sort of a internal don't ask, don't tell policy often. Yeah. So 
the example I often share, which is, is uh, real examples of, it's not real names, but it's an amalgamation of different people. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone knows that the, you know, choir director Ronald lives in a one bedroom apartment with George. Yeah. And as long as George and Ronald never tell anyone that they're gay, never say they're dating, they can exist within that community. Mm -hmm. And every Sunday, the nice church ladies will try to set Ronald and George up with a woman because they don't know why those bachelors won't settle down. Right. And it's sort of a, everyone knows what's going on, right. but nobody wants to say anything. And I think what we're seeing shift now is LGBTQ people being a little tired of hiding, right. feeling like they should be able to be public with their love, be public with who they are. Right. You know, I went to a local church uh, here in Richmond with a friend mm -hmm. for service and walked in and a transgender woman I know was there and you know, she had her hair done and she had finger, long fingernails up and she came and she grabbed my arm and she said, so good to see you, so glad you're here. By the way, call me this name and use he, him pronouns here. They don't know I'm transgender. And then we went to the service and the pastor said, can I have all the male ushers stand up? And she stood up. Now again, this is a woman with full makeup, long hair, nails, but they all viewed her as a man and viewed her as, as not who she was, but as a man within the church. So, so that ability to sort that cognitive dissonance yeah. around uh, believing what you see uh, yeah. is big. And then uh, I think that the reason people hide is mm -hmm. for really one of two reasons. One is the really harmful stuff we see when uh, church or synagogue or mosque leaders get up mm -hmm. and you know, demonize LGBTQ people. Yeah. What we see more of, to be quite frank, is the folks that say nothing. Right. right? It's the folks that will um, sort of not talk about LGBTQ relationships at all, mm -hmm. but will do a little bit of wink, nudge, sort of, yeah. you know, well, you have to live into God's word. Yeah. But they don't say what that actually means. They don't give yeah. examples. Right. And that's where I think a lot of the, the harm we see is done is mm -hmm. actually um there's absolutely the what often people refer to as the hellfire brimstone folks right. uh but then there's the this this sort of large middle group of congregations and and religious folks that just don't say one thing or the other yeah that leads lgbtq folks in those congregations to feel like they have to hide in order to fully right. exist yeah so what we would say is a more affirming and welcoming approach mm -hmm. is to talk publicly and positively about LGBTQ people. Right. I'm really struck by the danger of silence. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what we're hoping for is churches to take a more positive public approach in how they talk about LGBTQ folks. Right. And that's really layered because we have seen churches try to make the right step Mm -hmm. but actually sort of still do harm. And so an example of this is the uh, love the sinner, hate the sin uh, idea, which I think for some people they view as allyship, right? I still love you. I still care about you. We right. all sin and this is just your sin. But I think that that makes people feel like who they are right. is sinful and wrong. And even though, again, I would argue that is a step in the right direction, it still causes some harm. And instead, I think talking uh, about LGBTQ people in affirming ways, in positive ways, allowing LGBTQ people to have leadership roles within, the, mm -hmm. if there are leadership roles within the uh, religious organization, right. allowing LGBTQ folks to be married, mm -hmm. um, to have, you know, for example, in some traditions, you are baptized and given a different name. And for some transgender folks, they look to then have that process redone with their new gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think those are some positive examples. And then there's really another uh, sort of level to this where you see some religious leaders not only talking positively about LGBTQ folks in the current reality, but looking at scripture and holy texts to find LGBTQ people within those texts. Right. And so one of my favorite examples comes from a uh, activist, a transgender activist named J. Mays III, who is also a poet who looks at mm -hmm. both the Muslim faith and the Christian faith. And one of the things he does in one of his poems is talk about um, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, sort of that story people know. Yeah. 
And one of the other translations of coat in the text is actually what we would now think of as a princess dress. Yeah. And what would it mean if Joseph, the little boy, got a dress from his father mm -hmm. and then was really happy and fabulous and wonderful yeah. and then was sort of hurt in the village because of that? Yeah. And when you think about that story, it's like, oh, actually, that makes a lot more sense than just getting a coat. Yeah, um, Right. And so those are, and again, it's not saying this is the definite word. This is how it happened. It's saying, here's another interpretation of this text oh, yeah. that we could look at that yeah. actually includes what right. we would never think of as transgender people within this uh, theology. And so, again, that's sort of a, a much higher level. But I think for, um, for folks that are looking to start their pathway towards allyship, it really starts with talking positively about LGBTQ mm -hmm. folks and incorporating LGBTQ folks fully in what the religious group does. So mm -hmm. again, weddings and naming ceremonies and leadership roles. Some churches even have committees for LGBTQ and ally groups. I know like the first UU churches often have those. Mm -hmm. um, and so those help. Uh, and then lastly, I would say that there are um, faith leaders and faith communities reaching out to the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having uh, your, your organization at pride parades or pride festivals, um, supporting organizations like Side by Side, we have had, uh, and I know this is, I think, one of your questions, uh, we have had faith organizations provide, when we're in person, we do meals every group. And so we've had churches provide meals for the groups. Um, we've had churches, you know, do pass the hat on a Sunday uh, and donate those funds to us. Mm -hmm. um, and what I always tell church leaders uh, or any religious figure, if you're going to come visit our center for a positive reason, I want you in the full religious garb because I want those youth to see, you know, the Catholic priest with the collar or the Episcopal priest with the collar walking in the door, smiling, happy to be there. Because yeah. even that small moment makes a huge difference to young folks. Yes, I hear what you're saying. Um, tell me the name again of the poet. J, just the letter J, huh? Maze, M-A-S-E, and then the third. Okay. Oh, I'm so happy to know. I, I have run across some other transgender Bible scholars. One is Austin Hartke. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar yeah. with Austin Hartke? Not personally, but know of no, Austin's no, work a little, no. yeah. Um, so I'm really happy to know about um, J. Mays III as a poet. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. The other thing I was going to say is that people often think, they assume what the Bible says about LGBTQ people, but there's really nothing said. I mean, Jesus said nothing. There's really nothing that is said. There are verses that are used to, and people will call them the clobber verses, mm -hmm. as you know, um, but the text doesn't say what people, people kind of put onto the text, project their modern worldview, mm -hmm. which is a non-inclusive worldview in many cases, rather than looking at what the text actually has to say. Mm -hmm. And the translation of the word in as homosexuality was only put in there in 1996 mm -hmm. by um, the people who were translating at that point. They took the modern word and inserted it as a translation of the Greek word, and it's, it's not what it said. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's a lot of education about sacred text to be done as well, um, and I appreciate what you had to say about that very much. Mm -hmm. What are some things that you would like us to know? People who would be watching this video would be people who want to know more, who want to support you, who are really just beginning, who are deep into being an ally or living as an LGBTQ young person. And what would you like the viewers of this interview to know? Anything you want? So, you know, given that we're in the midst of a pandemic, uh, one thing I would say is that anytime a, a global event like what we're seeing happens, uh, it impacts underrepresented communities differently mm -hmm. and often more harshly. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that already with LGBTQ folks. Mm -hmm. And so as we start talking about recovery and, and next steps, I would say being mindful of what uh, equitable recovery looks like. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, what does it look like to ensure that the institutions that we're looking to to get us through the pandemic and beyond are fully inclusive of everyone? You know, there are countless stories right now out of New York of the tent hospitals that were set up to deal with the pandemic mm -hmm. that are being run by Franklin Graham and his organization mm -hmm. that have denied LGBTQ people services mm -hmm. um, during a pandemic. Um, and those organizations uh, will receive, are still doing good work, don't get me wrong, but they're not doing it for everybody. Right. And so as we enter recovery, I would say to, to really, um, you know, make sure that we have uh, an eye on how do we help everybody mm -hmm. equitably. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of working with Side by Side, you know, we are um, a year-round organization. We don't just operate when school is in session. Uh, and even with the pandemic, we're still providing that direct service for young folks and particularly focusing on their mental health. Right. And while we definitely have to be focused uh, on food and shelter for people, which is some of what Side by Side does, we also have to be looking at people's mental health and keeping them healthy in all aspects of their life. Right. And so would you know, really encourage folks who are able to, of course, financially give to Side by Side. Uh, mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, we really need some folks who are willing to open their homes to LGBTQ young adults who are facing mm -hmm. housing instability. Yeah. And I would say, you know, are there ways now that you're home with family or you're in more intimate settings, are there ways to have those uh, courageous ally conversations? Yeah. And you talk about LGBTQ inclusion with your family now that you're home. Yeah. Uh, and can you help your uh, brothers and sisters and siblings and cousins and grandma wrap their head around this and get them to a place where they can be more supportive? Right, right, thank you. Um, another question I have is the history of Side by Side. People might be interested to hear you tell the story of its founding, mm -hmm. if you would be willing to do that. Sure. So we are actually one of the uh, more seasoned, if you will, LGBTQ youth organizations. We were founded in 1991 as the Richmond Organization for Sexual Minority Youth to specifically support, uh, at the time, uh, lesbian and gay high school students uh, in their coming out process and trying our best to keep them with their family. Now, we've always had transgender and bisexual and other identities there, but they didn't really get named until a little bit later in our history. And uh, we've been doing our Tuesday night support group for LGBTQ young folks 14 to 20 since 1991. Mm -hmm. um, it's moved around, it's been in church basements, it's been in counselors' waiting rooms, uh, and now we have our own youth center that we've been in for a little over a decade over on Westwood Avenue in Richmond. And we've expanded into Charlottesville uh, about a decade ago and uh, have also uh, expanded down uh, at our only school-based program at Petersburg High School. And I think that, you know, with the, our history, one of the things that's important to note is that we have been around for so long in the South, in the former capital of the Confederacy, in the Bible Belt. Uh, when I often go to national conferences uh, with the LGBTQ community, everyone thinks I live in Richmond, California. No one <laughs> thinks that we're doing this stuff in Virginia. Um, and so I think it's really a testament. <laughs> Yeah. It's really a testament to the community that we've been around uh, for so long. Yeah, wow. And you know, I think that going back to the equity conversation, something I've been sharing more often when we talk about our history, is those early years, we were only funded by the generosity of uh, donors. You know, we weren't funded by foundations, we weren't funded by corporations, and that's changed over the years. So now we are able to do more because we receive more funding, because there's more acceptance of our community. Yeah. You know, back in the day, the Richmond Times Dispatch wouldn't even run paid ads that we paid money for to go in the newspaper. And now they seek us out for stories and to highlight the good work we're doing and our community members. Wow. And so that's a big change uh, in our history. Wow. That's a big change. That's over 30 years. Um, what do you think caused that change? Yeah. I think the biggest change that we have seen has come from uh, LGBTQ people being out publicly with who they are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 
uh, I think that, um, you know, the, the easiest example in my lifetime that a lot of people remember is when Ellen DeGeneres came out yeah. on her TV show, we were debating same gender marriage. It was, you know, in the late nineties, it was, it would be years before this became a national thing. Um, but it, it sort of shifted the conversation from, oh, I don't know about gay and lesbian people getting married to, what do you mean Ellen can't get married? I like Ellen, Ellen's nice. Mm -hmm. And so putting a face to our stories mm -hmm. um, really changed the, the course of history, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think that having people uh, be authentic with who they are. Um, and then we're also seeing, thankfully, their family members supporting them. Yeah. So uh, unlike other minority groups, being LGBTQ is not uh, the same in terms of you're not off, you know, having an LGBTQ kid means you probably don't have LGBTQ parents. Right. Uh, so uh, it, it changes people's uh, personal politics sometimes mm -hmm. when it is your family member, when it is your child, when it is your aunt or uncle, when it is your parent that changes our understanding of whether or not these people should have rights, whether or not these people should be allowed to be teachers, whether or not these people should be allowed to get married yeah. or have access to healthcare, that changes things. And uh, we see that all the time. You know, uh, mm -hmm. former Vice President Dick Cheney, his daughter is an out lesbian mm -hmm. and uh, he's a very political conservative, but he's actually never publicly really said anything negative about the LGBTQ community. And when Maryland, the state he was living in at the time and his daughter was in, was debating legalizing same gender marriage, he personally called state senators and advocated for it on behalf of his daughter. Hmm. So we see this all the time. Folks who uh, understand uh, who they are uh, and uh, support their family members. Yeah. I think that's the biggest change. Mm -hmm. um, the other change I would say to your point earlier is the ability to connect uh, is becoming a lot easier with mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. um, stories can get out in new ways. Um, right. With the pandemic, I've been racking my mind to try to figure out how we would do this before the internet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if if COVID-19 had hit in the 1980, what in the world would we have done? Yeah. Um, but uh, the ability to connect across the globe Mm -hmm. and build community and find allies has dramatically changed yeah. the landscape as well. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, it reminds me of the phrase, the personal is political. And just the movement has come about because people have acted and, and come forward and spoken up for others, for themselves. So it's really been Absolutely. a very personal movement over time so courage there's a lot of courage absolutely created the change but we are still needing courage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. um is there anything i didn't cover in my list of questions let me take a look um uh yeah i think the only piece that i would note um is uh, as we as we wrap up is in in recent years um, since actually uh, or late 2016 early 2017 mm -hmm. there has been a, a resurgence of anti LGBTQ sentiment um, and while we have certainly made progress there is a lot of fear still around what the future holds for our community right. Right. Um, and you know on the political landscape there's still a lot of folks uh, who hold high offices who are not supportive of the community. Right. Um, and there's still uh, concerns about, you know, there's a couple of Supreme Court cases that supposedly will be ruled on soon. Yeah. That will decide whether or not LGBTQ folks can uh, be fired for being gay or transgender. Yeah. Um, there's the, you know, the transgender military ban is still in effect. There's, so I think that uh, I would just say that while progress has been great, uh, the work is not done and that we need to be vigilant of the blowback we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. And if you look across history, you know, you'll see, um, you'll see sort of, you know, the, the 60s and 70s, the LGBTQ rights movement really gaining a lot of big wins. Mm -hmm. And then you see the 80s and the AIDS epidemic and you see a big backlash. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then you see the 90s with more pro LGBT and the 2000s, right? And then you're now seeing the backlash again. And so while we'll never go back to where we were, we need to be cognizant and vigilant of uh, what's at risk for LGBTQ folks. Yeah, that is really important. And that's, that's a really good thing to bring out at the end here, just what is happening now, the backlash, and um, that we can continue with being courageous and encouraging people who are being courageous and act on behalf of LGBTQ people. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome.